name is Chris Cosmidis. I'm an infectious diseases consultant at the National Spurgeonosis Center in Manchester. Today we're going to discuss therapeutic drug monitoring for azole antifungals. In order to be able to um, perform TDM effectively, you need to really know what are the reasons uh, for it, why do we really need to do TDM. And also you need to be aware of the different TDM methods that are out there and what are the differences between them. And after that we're going to review the, main, the, the two main azoles for which we do TDM, which are itraconazole and boriconazole. So why do we need to do TDM? First of all, azoles are notorious for having a lot of drug interactions, and some of those interactions will affect their levels. The most relevant one, probably clinically, is use of proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, which are known to induce absorption of the itraconazole capsule. And this is actually quite a common interaction in real life. Another important interaction is um, the antimicrobial rifampicin, which is known to increase azole metabolism, resulting in actually in uh, often undetectable levels of itraconazole. So you should never use rifampicin with itraconazole together, you will not achieve good itraconazole level. Um, like most drugs, um, you need to a certain compliance, especially when you use antifungals for a long time, for example, uh, using itraconazole in allergic or chronic aspergillosis. You really want to make sure that compliance is not an issue, so a TDM can help you with that. Uh, in addition to that, some patients with severe disease, for example, brain aspergillosis, which you are treating with boriconazole, you really want to make sure that you are having a good therapeutic levels. So that's another reason to do TDM in those, those patients. And finally, um, the uh, azole antifungals really display some pharmacokinetic variability. There are different uh, pharmacokinetics in children, in the elderly, and also in patients who are acutely ill in the intensive care unit. So this is where you really need to focus on, on, on TDM management. There's no need to uh, check fluconazole levels because that's really a uh, more predictable uh, drug in terms of pharmacokinetics. It's very well absorbed orally. So we don't generally do fluconazole levels, although we do need uh, to check uh, itraconazole and boriconazole levels. Which TDM methods are out there? Bioassay is the most widely used. It's actually a cheap method and quite simple to perform. It has some drawbacks. For example, other antifungals that the patient has been on may interfere with the results of the test. And also, especially regarding itraconazole, it measures itraconazole combined with its metabolite, hydroxytraconazole. So it measures the combined activity of the two drugs and not just itraconazole itself. HPLC is also another widely available drug, which um, Again, it's relatively simple to perform, uh, and the advantages are in that it can detect multiple drugs in one sample, and also you can measure itraconazole um, separately from its metabolite, so you'll get different results with the HPLC and with the bioassay with, on, for itraconazole. Mass spectrometry is a more expensive test, so it's not widely used, but it's much more sensitive and specific. Moving on to discuss itraconazole. Itraconazole is available in an oral solution, and, and oral capsules. The oral solution is 30% more bioavailable and that it is better uh, absorbed. Um, the capsules have to be taken with food and ideally an acidic beverage like cola in order to improve absorption. And uh, just to mention again the scenario with the, the pa patient being on omeprazole, this will reduce the uh, itraconazole absorption of the capsule, but it will not affect the absorption of the liquid. In contrast, the oral solution is better taken on an empty stomach, so that's the difference there. And steady state is achieved after one to two weeks of therapy. So you don't need to measure trough levels of itraconazole, you can measure random levels. That should be as good. And as I mentioned before, BioSay and HPLC measure different things. BioSay measures both metabolites and HPLC just measures itraconazole. So what evidence is out there? to help us, to guide us with uh, the uh, recommendations for TDM monitoring. So the, uh, the most abundant evidence we have is from the neutropenic population where there has been a large meta-analysis of cases um, uh, several years ago that showed that the traconazole suspension is better at preventing invasive aspergillosis in those patients and that it achieves better levels. And it was also shown that the trough level of less than 0.5 resulted in high mortality in those patients as it was not preventing aspergillosis. Um, some other data with fewer patients shows that itraconazole, when used for candida esophagite, is actually uh, is, is more effective if the level is 0 0.1 to 1. So in, in, um, uh, in summary, probably a level of 4.5 to 1, or even higher than 1, would be what you would want uh, measured with HPLC. 
There's also some data on metropolitan levels and toxicity, but this is now using the bioassay. This study used the bioassay to show that a level of 17.1 milligrams per liter was the best predictor of toxicity. So, um, if we want to make recommendations based on the available evidence, the recommended range for the bioassay would be 5 to 17, and the recommended range for HPLC would be 1 to 3. And the equivalence, if you want to uh, compare the two results, would be that the levels that you get with HPLC are roughly one-fifth of what you would get with the uh, bioassay. And as I mentioned, the levels can be random, doesn't have to be trough level. So, the, of course, the difficulty is what to do when the levels are too high or too low. The common scenario is that the levels are low. If the levels are above range, you would aim to reduce the dose by 100 to 200 milligrams per day. Um, if the levels are below range, which is the most common situation, you, first of all, you have to check the compliance and interactions with other drugs, especially in microsoft. And if possible, you, you have to stop the orthopump inhibitor if the patient can, can tolerate that. And then you would increase the total daily dose by 1 to 200 milligrams. And if uh, the patient has not been following the uh, food requirements, you have to focus on that and ask them to take the medication with food or cola or another acidic drink. And of course, the other strategy is to switch from capsules to liquid. The equivalent dose, you can use half the dose of, of uh, the solution, which should be equivalent to, to, the, to um, the dose of the capsules. Moving on to voriconazole. For voriconazole, there is even more evidence that we have to do TDM as it is really unpredictable in terms of pharmacokinetics. You can really uh, increase the dose by uh, a small margin and you get really high levels, or conversely, you can get undetectable levels for a very long time, even on somebody on a very high doses. The oral bioavailability is much better compared to traconazole, more than 80% when it's lower in children. The advice is to take it on an empty stomach, unlike traconazole capsules. And again, um, in contrast to traconazole, omeprazole can actually increase Voriconazole level to some extent, and this can be um, used by some clinicians. If the patient is on omeprazole, you can actually get better voriconazole uh, levels. What's really important to know about voriconazole is it is the uh, azole that is metabolized to a significant extent by the enzyme 2CIF19, which um, displays a huge uh, variability in the human population. For example, up to 30% of Asians would have significantly low activity of this enzyme, and therefore they will not be able to metabolize voriconazole effectively, and this will result in actually toxic levels. So um, you have to be really aware of, of the, the, um, the epidemiology of this enzyme and the, the person you're, you're treating. And this patient may, may actually develop significant toxicity from it. And on the other hand, children metabolize voriconazole faster through this uh, enzyme, and therefore higher doses are recommended uh, when we treat uh, children with voriconazole. And it has been shown that better levels uh, better outcomes are achieved when you, uh, you do TDM for voriconazole. And this study summarizes this. It shows that patients who were randomized to voriconazole TDM actually had fewer discontinuations of the, of the voriconazole and also had better response to treatment. So uh, voriconazole TDM is really known to be a um, um, recommendation when you treat somebody with voriconazole. There is also some data on toxicity. This study showed that a level of higher than 5.5 uh, resulted in uh, significantly more neurotoxicity. It's, of course, a small number of patients, but every patient with neurotoxicity had a level of higher than 5.5. And also what has been shown uh, only in, in, in Japanese study was that um, liver abnormalities were also related to high voriconazole levels in this study. So in summary, uh, for voriconazole, you need to measure a trough level, and you aim for a level higher than one to maximize uh, efficacy. And if you're treating a severe infection like brain aspergillosis, for example, it would be reasonable to aim for even higher levels, higher than two. Mm -hmm. And to minimize toxicity, it would be best to try to keep the levels below 5.5. And uh, you would probably be more proactive in repeating levels uh, sooner than you would do with intraconazole. For example, when you start voriconazole, you would check a level within five days of starting and then after every change or when you change from IV to oral formulation. So it's really tricky to make very um, generalized recommendations for voriconazole TDM monitoring. As I said, every patient would respond differently, so you need a close follow-up and expert uh, opinion there. So um, mm -hmm. if the level is above range, you would generally reduce by 50%. 
If the levels are very high, which could be observed, for example, in somebody who is a low metabolizer, you might even consider a different antifungal, which might be safer for the patient, or you might skip a dose and then start at a lower dose. If the levels are below range, again, you would check compliance and interactions, and you would increase by up to 50%. For example, if they're on the tablet formulation, you can increase by 50 to 100 milligrams daily, or twice daily. And again, if you're giving a very high dose, like for example, 350 milligrams twice a day orally, you might again consider a different antifungal if the patient is not achieving therapeutic levels. And again, to focus to emphasize, it's very important to recheck the levels um, quite promptly after you make a change in the dose. So I'll briefly mention other antifungals, which have been available more recently. Osaconazole suspension is a newer antifungal with uh, activity also against uh, zygomycosis. It's, there are issues with absorption. It's better absorbed with a fatty meal, which may be difficult for some patients. So there are real problems with some therapeutic levels there. The recommendation is to aim for a level of 4.7 when you are giving the prophylaxis and to a level of more than 1 if you are giving it for treatment. And a general recommendation also is to try to keep the level below 3.75. Uh, but not huge evidence uh, behind this. Um, we recently have posaconazole tablets who have, who have, which have bypassed this problem with the, um, the food requirement. So it can, they can be taken on an empty stomach and uh, or with food, and they usually result in better levels. But you still need to do uh, posaconazole TDM, as they, uh, approximately 10% of patients will still have some therapeutic levels even on, on posaconazole tablets. And finally, the newest azole is isaconazole, for which there are no formal uh, recommendations regarding TDM, as it tends to achieve quite um, good therapeutic levels, so there's not much information yet about um, toxicity or, 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 or uh, efficacy. Uh, in correlation with TDM. Um, so in summary, itraconazole and boriconazole are the main azole antifungals for which we need, need to do TDM. There is some evidence for both of them, more evidence for boriconazole, and it's really important to, to keep an eye on, on itraconazole and boriconazole levels regularly in order to prevent toxicity and also to enhance efficacy of therapy. Thank you.